Well, good morning, and welcome to Grace Harvest Bible Church this beautiful Sunday. And uh, I just want to uh, remind folks that today at 3 o'clock, um, I would encourage you to uh, come back. And even if you don't have children or involved in our homeschool ministry, we have an event this afternoon as we uh, finish another successful year uh, with our homeschoolers. And uh, what a joy it is uh, that we are able to do that here. So it's from 3 to 5. I encourage you to come and and uh, um, and see what the students have done and uh, meet some of the folks that are behind the scenes that you may not and some of you may be wondering is this something that I can do could I be a homeschool mom uh, you come and and uh, the the moms that are there will be glad to answer any questions that you might have uh, also uh, uh, men's study is coming up this Friday again we're excited about it you know I was uh, willing to take a break all summer and uh and figure that I had enough to read, uh, but, uh, but uh, the men spoke, and they wanted to have another study, so on Friday, starting this Friday at uh, 6 a.m., someone asked, could we do it a little bit later in the morning? Uh, I would vote for that, but you'd have to talk to the men who have to be at work, so 6 o'clock uh, this coming Friday, uh, we're reading the book War on Men, War on Men. You can get it online. Uh, I would encourage you to sign up and come and be a part of that as well. If you turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 6, I'll be reading from verses 15 and 18 this morning as we continue our journey through this book of Romans. I, I tell you, uh, being a history buff, it is, it is uh, exciting for me to look at the history of, the, of what was going on in the first century. Uh, some of you may know that during this time Nero was uh, emperor of Rome in uh, when um, uh, Paul lost his head around 64, 65 A.D. Soon after that, Nero was assassinated around 68 A.D. And then they had a time in the empire of four emperors. And three of them came, went real quick. And then Vespasian, uh, who was uh, uh, considered a, a great uh, emperor, he wasn't as cruel like the last ones. He wasn't a believer by any stretch of imagination. As a matter of his fact, he was withdrawn from uh, Israel. He was fighting the Judean rebellion that was occurring. And his son Titus was the legate that actually surrounded Israel. I mean, Jerusalem uh, breached the walls and tore the temple down. In Rome to this day, there is an Arc de Triomphe, Triomphe for Titus. It stands today. And, and if you went to Rome, you could visit. And this is the arch that was put up for Titus's defeat of the Judean rebellion. When the temple was taken down, the second temple, to this day, there's a monument that sits in Rome that celebrates that. And Christ himself, when he died, remember, he said, you destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And the, the temple, the earthly temple was done away with. There is no need for that earthly temple any longer. And so you put in that all in mind when you're thinking of, and that's what I, when I look at the book of Romans, I look at it from a historical perspective, not only a, a spiritual perspective, because you see what's going on in, uh, during this time and, and all, the, all the trials and tribulations are going around. And yet we get this wonderful, wonderful epistle from the, from the Apostle Paul as he, as he explains to us again the freedom, and that's what I've titled this, the freedom that we have in Christ. Back in July of 1976, um, 103 Jewish hostages were taken by terrorists in Entebbe, Uganda. And when we first flew, Kathy and I and Betsy and, and uh, flew into Uganda that very first time uh, back in 2007, and I, I remember uh, David Listrom, who had been a missionary there, for some 20 years in 2007, he came after uh, Idi Amin was there and in power, and they killed hundreds of thousands of his own people. And he said, look over there at that airport, that, that, that one over there, and we're looking at it, it's an old airport. He said, that's where the raid in Entebbe took place. He said, when I first came to Uganda, that plane sat on the runway, the very plane that was hijacked back in 1976. But in that year, the Jewish nation decided that they would not negotiate with the terrorists. So they sent commandos into Entebbe to free the people. The problem was, obviously, a tremendous and difficult challenge. How do they free 103 of their own people from seven terrorists? 
Their plan was simple. They entered the area where the hostages and terrorists were together and shouted in Hebrew, Get down now, crawl. Since the terrorists didn't understand Hebrew and all the Jewish citizens did, they simply shot everyone still standing after they yelled this. It was a great success in an escape for this escape story. All seven terrorists were killed and all 103 Jewish hostages were freed. Only two Jews were hit during the firing, one because he hesitated to obey, the other because he stood up too soon. But because of this, the hostages gained their freedom. The hostages themselves were helpless. Freedom came because trained commandos came to their rescue to defeat their captors. Likewise, we are powerless to be set free from the bondage of sin. But Christ came to set us free and has completely defeated Satan through the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. This plan of the Jewish nation was daring. Commandos had to be willing to risk their lives to free their country. Plan was even more daring. Jesus came to die in our place. And on the cross, Jesus took our sin upon him and paid the death penalty in our place. And it's a bold plan. Satan fell for it and thought he had won, but God also planned the resurrection. And death could not hold Jesus, and Satan was defeated so that we might be free. And so the plan of the freeing of the hostages required simple instructions. Everyone heard the words, get down, crawl. Only those who did as they were told were rescued. Similarly, God's calls goes out to those who are held captive in sin. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the book tells us, and you will be saved. Everyone who listens to God, who listens to His Word and obeys it, He does what the Word says. He is set free. And so today as we get ready to dive into this scripture, we need to understand the freedom that we do have in Christ and that Christ paid the price for us. It, we didn't do anything to earn that freedom. No, that's like the hostages didn't do anything to earn their freedom. You know, Bob Dylan wrote a song released in 1979 called You Gotta Serve Somebody. Many of us at my age remember that song. And this is how the lyrics went. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Bob Dylan writes, well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. He read Romans 6. <laughs> in Paul's day, as many as 10 million people out of the 50 million in the, in the Roman Empire that I just described a little while ago were slaves. I want you to think about that. 10 million of the 50 million people in the empire were slaves. At one point, after Spartacus' rebellion in the, early, in the last century B.C., um, where Spartacus defeated two legions and then eventually was betrayed and, and the rebellion ended. It scared the Romans so much so that they decided that what they wanted to do and tried in the Senate was to get all of the slaves to wear a certain color of clothing. And then someone spoke up and said, if we do that, they'll know how many there are. There were 10 million out of 50 million in the empire. And probably some of these slaves were the earliest Christians. So the language that Paul uses would have been crystal clear to his readers. Paul uses slavery to let his readers know what it means to be a follower of Christ. The ungodly, those who are not born again, Christians think they are free. The, 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 you talk, remember what it was like before you came to saving faith. You thought you were free. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I've shared this before, but I, I still remember Sean standing on his steps, 18-year-old young man getting ready to go into the Marine Corps, and he's standing up there and says, that's why I'm joining the Marines. I'm tired of you telling me what to do. 
let's face it, nobody likes to be told what to do, especially as an unbeliever. They reject God and His Son and follow their own lust. But Peter tells us that they are, what in 2 Peter 2.19? Slaves of corruption. God has freed you and I. If you're a believer here today, He has freed you from sin, but not to live as you please. He, it's, and I love the way that Paul uses that slave language. He doesn't say you were slaves to sin, now you're a freed man, and that's what would happen in the empire. If you were a slave and, and your master took mercy on you, or, or you earned it, or you could pay your, uh, your, your fee to get out of slavery, you became what was called a freed man. That doesn't, he doesn't use that language. You are slaves to sin and you become slaves of righteousness. But see, he frees us from sin to make us slaves of righteousness. Because as, as I said earlier, as Bob Dylan said so well, you have to serve somebody. You're either going to serve Satan or you're going to serve God. Now we come to our text this morning. Would you stand with me if you're able as we honor the reading of God's Word in Romans chapter 6, reading from verses 15 through 18. So what then? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? <laughs> May it never be. Do you not know that when you go on presenting yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of the teaching to which you were given over. And having been freed from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Oh, Father... We have gathered in this place we call Grace Harvest. Father, we have gathered as your people and we have fellowshiped this morning. We have sat under the instruction of teachers who have who've studied and prayed over the very lessons that they gave today. And Father, we have come and we have sung songs of praise to you, Lord. We have lifted our voices up in an act of worship. We have given of our first fruits to you, Lord the blessings that you have given to us. And Father, now we come to the proclamation of your word. Father, I pray this morning, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we, we who have been set free from sin, Father, would understand what that means in our lives. And Lord, I pray for the one here who does not know you as Lord and Savior, that thinks they're free, but they are slaves of sin father i pray for the one that's hurting here today that they would be comforted i pray for the one who needs encouraging lord that your words would be an encouragement to them as well but through it all father i pray that you receive the glory for it we ask this in the precious name of your son our lord jesus christ amen so as we look at these verses this morning Okay. As we look at these verses this morning, Paul clarifies what it means to be under grace. What it means to be under grace. And so we're going to look at it in two parts. Not free to sin or commit to disobedience. So before we get into that, Pastor Cal was reminding me that today, and as I have not forgotten, that we celebrate Memorial Day tomorrow. And again, this isn't a time that we celebrate uh, the veterans that are in our lives. That's not what it's about. Don't walk up to a veteran and say, thank you for his service. What you do on Memorial Day is you remember the sacrifice that great men and women made to make sure that I can stand here and preach to you on a Sunday morning. That you have the freedom to go places that you would not be able to go to. When that greatest generation answered the call in 1941, which my dad was part of that generation, and went to fought the imperial armies of Japan and the Nazi regime. These were young men, 18, 19, 20 years old who died by the tens of thousands 
on beaches in the Pacific and in the fields of France and in Germany and Italy. To, to, for what? They died to make sure that we are free. And so as we think about that tomorrow, it's just not a day that we take off, but it's a day that we remember that we have been set free physically. But how important is it for us to remember our freedom in Christ? And so we look at this passage today, and we see that we are not free to sin. Look at verse 15 with me. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. How great would that be? Let's think about this. Before you came to Saving Faith and you enjoy doing all the things that you enjoy doing that weren't illegal, but they, they were still, you know, things that your mother wouldn't approve of, but you enjoy doing them. How great it would be if you came to Saving Faith and God said, you know, you're free now to do anything that you want to do. What would be the point? Because that kind of thing, if you're honest with yourself, never brings joy in your life. And that's what I'm talking about. You, you may be happy for a little while. But to have joy in your life, you need to make sure that sin is being killed by you daily. As John Owen says. So, but before we dive into this verse, we need to go back to the previous one. Okay, so look back with me to verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Excuse me, excuse me. Let me get back to chapter 6. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So Paul here is giving the what then. That's why we have to look at verse 14. He's saying, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but what under grace. What do we do now? What, what should we do? See, Paul's anticipating the argument that will be made against his teaching. That, okay, so I've been set free from this, so now I can continue in sin. I can do anything I want to. And so he's saying, which teaching? That salvation is apart from any works is what he's talking about. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? As he anticipates their thinking and their questioning, if salvation is apart from works, then I have no obligation as a Christian to do any good works. If my salvation is apart from works, if I'm a saved without obeying the law, if I'm saved simply by faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace, then I have no obligation to obey the law now that I am a Christian. And some would have believed, I can do anything I want. And there are some immature Christians that have not been taught correctly that think the same way. And from the Jewish legalists who believed obedience to God's law was the only way of salvation, they would have objected to his teaching this at all. But understand this, this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul is ready to answer his rhetorical question. He now addresses what he knows is the mind in the mind of many of his listeners, many of those who would read this epistle. Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? The answer is no. Plain and simple, it's no. We are not under law in the sense that we have to obey it in order to earn our salvation. Some have come out of legalistic churches where you were told that you, uh, you, you can... Uh, you, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But you got to make sure that when you come to church, you wear a coat and tie. And ladies, you got to make sure you're wearing a dress below your knees. You got, there's all kinds of rules in place. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. And you might have been thinking, well, wait a minute, what happened to the freedom? Well, what happens is, as Paul said in the book of Galatians, you're allowing people to put you back under bondage. And give you rules and regulations that God does not put on his people. And so there is this, this notion by some that, that because I'm a Christian, I have to make sure that I follow a set pattern of rules. But you see, as believers, we're under, we are under the law of God to obey in our sanctification. We obey because we belong to him. We obey because we want to obey. 
We obey because God is our master. Let's pause here just for a moment and ask the question, are Christians bound to the Old Testament law? Are we as Christians bound to the Old Testament law? We must ask ourselves, did Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection do away with the law? The key to understanding the relationship between Christians and the law is knowing that the Old Testament law was given to the nation of Israel and not to Christians. The law of God was composed of three parts. We've just talked this before, but it's worth repeating. It's the moral law, the judicial, excuse me, judicial law, and the ceremonial law was given to the nation of Israel. The moral, moral law was to regulate behavior for men and women. The judicial law, judicial law was for Israel's operation as a unique nation under God. And the ceremonial law was prescribed to structure Israel's worship to God. When Jesus came to suffer, to die, and to be raised again, he said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish it, but to fulfill to fulfill. He fulfilled the Old Testament law and it is not binding on us today. But before you start acting like those who believe in hyper grace or modern day agnostics that believe that, that I can do anything I want as Paul is addressing here, you can't. We, are, we need to understand that we are now under the law of Christ under the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens as to fulfill the law of Christ, Paul writes to the church in Galatia. What is the law of Christ? It can be summed up in two commands. Recorded in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. Two commands. And when one of the scribes came and heard him, them arguing, he recognized that he was, had answered them well and asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? In verse 29 of chapter 12 in Mark, Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Shall we continue to live as we have always lived if it has nothing to do with giving us acceptance with God? He finishes out. So we know that we are still to obey the law of Christ, even though we are not bound by the Old Testament law. So the answer to Paul's question, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace, is an emphatic no. Paul says, shall it never be? In other words, R.C. Sproul says to those people, what's wrong with you people? That you think that you can keep on sinning once you've been set free from that. So what say you this morning, Christian? Do you desire to live for Christ or are you just glad that he saved you from the pits of hell? And you're going to live any way you want to and do anything you want to. Think anything you want to think. It doesn't matter what Christ thinks because you have been saved. But what your answer should be, do you desire to live for Christ? When it comes to shall I sin, your answer should be so loud that you say never, never let it be in my life. Do you believe that this morning, Christian? Never let that be in my life that I say sin should reign. That I should be, have this desire to sin over everything else that I do. Verse 16, do you not know that when you go on presenting yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Paul spells it out here. He drills home the message on who reigns in your life that we talked about last week. Who is it that reigns? Is it God or Satan? Is it righteousness or sin? There can be no misunderstanding of what Paul is conveying here. No, it's not left up to some, some interpretation that, 
that, that's up for question. He uses the analogy of slavery, and Paul writes this to the believers in Rome who were, again, as I said earlier, were very familiar with slavery. It is estimated that during in Italy, where Rome is located during the Roman Empire, that between 30 and 40 percent of the population were slaves. Can you think about that? I gave you those numbers earlier, but there was a greater portion of slaves in Italy around Rome than anywhere else in the empire. In the entire empire, at a minimum of 10 to 15 percent of the population were slaves that were owned by masters. It wasn't a racial issue because slaves came from every different color of skin and every ethnic background. You, would, you could, be, you could uh, sell yourself into slavery. There was no bankruptcy. They, matter of fact, bankruptcy is a fairly modern thing. It wasn't even around but a couple hundred years ago. But before that, they put you in prison, remember? Uh, if you couldn't pay your debt, they put you in prison. Well, back in the Roman Empire, they just made you a slave until you could pay it off, and you couldn't pay it off because you were a slave. So someone would have to pay your debt for you. Some people were sold into slavery. They were captured, sold into slavery. But most of in the empire came from conquest. You want to know why Rome was so hungry to, to go into Hispani Hispaniol and, and to Gaul and to Germania and Britannia and all the regions of the empire? Was they would go in, they would conquer a people. The, the soldiers that they didn't slay, they would sell them into, into slavery. The children and women they would take and they would sell them into slavery. And so these people would come into the empire as slaves. Some people were born into slavery. Their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents were slaves in the Roman Empire. And so they knew what Paul was talking about. For us, it's something that happened in our country some 200 years ago. And thankfully that God has, at least in the western part of the world, has ridded us of this horrible thing we call slavery. But folks, there are just as many slaves in the world today as there were 200 years ago, if not more. Paul wants to make sure that we grasp through the Holy Spirit's inspiration that we grasp the concept of this slavery to sin and slavery to righteousness. So Paul writes this, and it was a common experience. Do you not know, verse 16, do you not know, reader? Now we can understand how Paul could say this as though everyone knew this. Of course they knew about slavery. The key word in verse 16 is obedience. Obedience, which is used three times. Slaves is used twice in this verse. This is what slaves do. They don't have a choice. They don't, the, their master doesn't say, hey, would you kindly go and chop wood for the fire? Or would you kindly go fix my dinner? It's a command. It's a command given. And if the slave doesn't respond, he's what? He's punished. So they learn quickly. If you get stripes across your back, you're going to learn quickly that as a slave, you're going to do whatever the master tells you. It's a slave's job. It's a one-word job description for a slave. Obey. Whatever I say, you do. You obey your master. Slaves give themselves up completely to fulfill the desires of their master. Paul makes the spiritual application at the end of this verse. He says that every person is a slave, either to sin, resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. This means the one who is a slave of sin is an unbeliever. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, you're a slave to sin. You're a child of the evil one. Your father is the devil. And while you're sitting here going, that's impossible. I'm a good person. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not evil. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, the Bible's clear. You belong to one or the other. You're a slave of God or you're a slave of Satan. And how we respond in this life, how we live, determines who we belong to. There's an entirely different wage for those who are slaves to righteousness. This righteousness is not the imputed righteousness in justification, but the, 
imparted righteousness in sanctification. This is the growing practical righteousness a believer experiences in daily Christian life. When you, when you, when you get up and you, you spend time with the Lord in the morning. And you set your mind on the things of God and you rejoice that God has given you breath this day. And whether it's cloudy or rainy or sunshiny, you give glory to God for the day He's given you. And as you put on the full armor of God to go about your business, as you pray with your spouse, as you pray with your children, as you pray when you're the only one in the home and you open up the book and you begin your day, your mind is already on the things of God. Your master. You're being obedient to righteousness that God has called you to. And then you set forth from the day and you ask the Lord, Lord, do not lead me into temptation. As I go about my business today, Lord, as I put on that full armor of God and my desire is to serve you, remind yourself as you walk out the door that you're a slave to righteousness. That you were once that slave to sin, but that is not you any longer. Not at all. See, this is the growing practical righteousness of believer experiences as we go about our daily lives. The word righteousness is used here with personal holiness. It's synonymous with it. It's personal holiness and practical godliness is going on in your life. We are all slaves and we all have a master. Either our master is sin or our master is Jesus Christ. And I, for one, my master is Christ. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my King. And so I choose to serve Him. And do I do it faithfully every day? Oh, no. Do I sin still? Yes. Do I have regret and remorse over the sin? Oh, yes, dear one, I do. And see, the difference between me now and me before was when I was a slave to sin, I had no, more, no remorse, no regret. If you're here today and you have no remorse or regret, I always worry about that person who is, who is t giving testimony about their former life and they glorify the sin that was in their life. And they talk about it with a smile on their face. Almost like they miss it. I worry about that brother or sister in Christ. Because our sin, we should despise that which separates us from Christ. That would send him to the cross we should despise and hate, not look back on fondness. And we need to understand if Jesus is our master, we will live for him. But it, again, it doesn't mean that we as believers obey perfectly. But our desire is to live that way. And we confess to God when the, we do sin. Each of you... Each one of you who is a believer here this morning understands this perfectly clear. And you who are not a believer this morning, scratching your head saying this makes no sense to you, understand that the Bible is foolishness to those who are perishing. And I would urge you this very hour to ask God to open up your eyes and soften your heart. Because the sin that you're in now, the sin that you enjoy, the sin that you don't want to separate yourself from is, is the sin that will condemn you to hell. And you will spend eternity apart from Christ because you have shaken your fist at God with His invitation to come to Him. To come to Him. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. All those who confess with their mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the death, the Bible tells us, will be saved. You believe, Christian, along with me, and you rejoice and you, and you give God the glory for the, for the sweet, sweet message of the gospel. That you were once a sinner on the road to perdition, on the way to hell. And God in His mercy and grace gave you the faith to believe that His Son lived a sinless life. That He went to the cross in your place. The punishment that you deserve, the hell that you deserve, God poured all that anger and wrath out on His Son. And He says, dear one, believe in me. Believe my Son died for you. I want you to be free from the slavery of sin. 
I want you to be made a slave of righteousness. I want you to be free from the pits of hell and rejoice that you're a child of God and that one day you will worship Him forever and ever. Oh, Christian, this life is so short and it is so fleeting. Every, think about this right now. How many of you, and you don't answer out loud, but how many of you right now could tell me, your pastor, the names of your great-grandparents? All eight of them. That's, that's 100 years ago. Do you remember them? <laughs> you know anything about them? Do you know what they did for a living? Do you know if they were Christians or not? 100 years, they're all forgotten. You will be forgotten in 100 years. You will be forgotten. Nobody will know, nobody will care that we lived, walked this earth. But God cares. And God saved you for a time such as this. He saved you so you would be His ambassador here in the year 2024. Not 100 years from now. Not 100 years ago. But He saved you so you could be alive today. So that you could be slaves of righteousness, living for Him sharing the truth of the gospel to bring the elect to saving faith. But the great thing about us Christians is to die does not mean death of a believer. We will be with him forever in glory. You know, I, I, uh, I had an opportunity to, to, to speak to a, a somebody here recently and and share the gospel with them. They were Roman Catholic. And I couldn't help but think as, as I was talking to this individual and, and talking about who they pray to. We pray to Mary and pray to the saints. And I couldn't help, I was reminded again, I think it was R.C. who said it, the greatest form of idolatry is praying to these dead saints praying to Mary what, what are you doing I am the Lord your God and I am a jealous God and I will have no other gods before me I've sent my son to die for you on a cross I have I have made it so there is no need for sacrifice any longer the the the, the temple curtain was torn in two there is no barrier between in the holy of holies between God and man now my son is your high priest. My son sits at my right hand and he makes intercession for you. The Holy Spirit indwells in you, Mark, and he gives you even the words to speak to me. He even speaks for you when you don't know what to say because all you are is grieving over the sin in your life or mourning over other people's sin and you cry out to me and it's the Holy Spirit that makes intercession through my son, who sits at my right hand, and you will pray to a woman? You will pray to a man who has died, who has died, and he was the only reason he may be a believer at all is because he put his faith and trust in me? And you tell me that that is worship? Straight from the pits of hell. I get so frustrated when people tell me, oh, Roman Catholics are Christian. They are idolaters. And when you come to saving faith and your eyes are open and you walk into a Catholic church or an Orthodox church and you have some man that you have to go to to seek forgiveness of your sins, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been one week since my last confession. And then this man, this man is going to make my soul whole with God? Blasphemy! Christ died to make me free. Christ died on the cross and said, Tetelestai, it is finished. We are His and we are His slaves. Not man's, not Satan's. We have been set free not to sin. And we, have, we are commanded and we should be committed to obedience. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that... Though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were given over. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. 
Paul here describes the great change that came over the Roman believers when God saved them. A believer commits to a life of obedience. When you came to Christ, you said, I love you, Lord. You are my Savior, and you're my Lord. You see, there is no salvation if he is not your Lord. You cannot just say, Jesus, I want the good part of you. I want the Savior part. But you can keep the Lord part for yourself. I'm not selfish. I'll just take the salvation. You leave me alone. And I hear people say this all the time. Well, I, you know, I don't need to do this in order to be a Christian. True. I don't need to go to church in order to be a Christian. True. I don't need to be baptized in order to be a Christian. True. I don't need to do this and read my Bible to be a Christian. True. But I tell you what, I would doubt whether you're a believer if you say, I don't want to be in God's house. I don't want to obey his commands. I don't want to do what he tells me to do. You're not his slave. He commands you to do those things. And you say, no. You shake your fist at God. No. You see, there's a radical change in us. Not a minor change. When you come to saving faith, you have changed. You have been slaves of sin, and we have now become obedient from the heart. And we want to hear sound teaching. I, I can remember how hungry I was for the Word of God when I got saved. I remember I, I wanted it. And every time I've had a spiritual revival in my life where, I, where I've been in dry valley of dry bones, and when my own making, nobody else is making my own. I didn't, wor I didn't read the Word. I didn't pray. It wasn't in fellowship. There was a time when, when uh, uh, I had an opportunity to work extra work as a police officer. And um, a whole $10 an hour on Sunday mornings for three hours, I would direct traffic at a Baptist church on Koala, uh, Koala in, uh, in Courthouse Road. I'd go up there. Kathy would take the kids to church, and I would go make my money. What kind of Christian was I? For 30 bucks. I would go and sit in a parking lot for three hours and justify that because I was bringing money home to my family. Dry bones. Dry bones, that's what I was doing. What, what was no hunger and desire? And I, and I can remember when, 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 when God just got a hold of me again and said, what are you doing? Not verbally. But for me, for me, just sitting there, you're thinking in my life, what, what's, what's my life doing? What am I doing with my life? What kind of example are to my children? The twins weren't born at that time. What, what, what are you doing with your life? And then I can remember when, when God got a hold of me, I, I would show up at church. I'd be there on Wednesday night. I, I, could, I was looking for a Bible study, and they said, well, we, we, have, a, we have prayer time. We don't have Bible study. I'm thinking, whew prayer time I want a Bible study I, I, I want I want somebody to instruct me and teach me what the Word of God has to say you feel that way Christian is there is there a desire to come here on Sunday mornings and be here at at, at, at early like quarter to nine and and start fellowship with other believers and get into a Sunday school class so that you can so you can soak in what the teacher has so faithfully and diligently studied and prayed over do you realize that our our teachers spend just as much time studying for their lessons as i do preaching mine and they and they do this and they come and and, and they teach is there a desire for you to be fed with god's word is there a desire to come to the women's studies when they're offered is there a desire to come to the men's study when they're offered or do you find other things in your life that are so busy so wrapped up if you evaluate your life and say what eternal purpose do these have in my life me sitting making thirty dollars an hour had no eternal purpose in my life i could have picked that job up somewhere else justified it in my own life but it had no eternal purpose. I wasn't gaining anything from it. You'd think I'd at least go inside and hear the preacher preach. But I made the excuse, well, it ain't my church. Didn't do that. We need to understand. It's important for us to grasp. There was a change of lordship from Satan's dominion to God's dominion. 
from the one of sin to the one of righteousness. There was a change of thinking. So now we submit to biblical truth where we reject it before. Now we submit to it. There was a change of your heart. So they were not willing. We are, excuse me, we're now willing and gladly and joyously surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Remember when you fell in love, men? Now speak to the men because I don't know how women feel when they fell in love. So I speak to the men. You remember how you felt? And again, we didn't have social media. I couldn't text Kathy, couldn't do any of that stuff. You know how I, you know how I actually called my wife for the very first time? 15 years old. And she gave me her name. That was it, Kathy Wells. And I said, can I call you? That took me about two months into summer school to ask her that. And she said, sure. She got on her bus. And I said, you dummy. You didn't get a telephone number. So you know what I did? I called every name in the phone book. That's persistence. I took the phone book out for Chesterfield. There was only 75,000 people back then. And I looked up every Wells, and I went down and called every Wells. Hello, is Kathy there? Wrong number. Hello, is Kathy there? Wrong number. Hello, is Kathy there? Yeah, but she's not in. Maybe there's another one. And guess what? There were two Kathy Wellses. So finally, I get to the right Kathy Wells. Still remember the number, 748-5927. Still remember that number. And uh, call it, and I remember calling, and her mother answered the phone. Oh, no, her father. Excuse me, it was her father. Hello? I see, yes, Kathy there? Well, she's out right now. I said, this is the Kathy that goes to Salem Middle School. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and I hung up. <laughs> I was so nervous. Oh, butterflies. My heart was changing. I, I was falling in love with this girl. Fifteen, I was falling in love with this girl. I know parents you hate when I say things like that. I was falling in love with her. And my whole life changed. All my thoughts were about her. I couldn't wait to get on the bus to go to, in summer school to go see her. So much so that the next year I signed up for summer school just so I could spend the summer with her in a class I didn't even need and then she broke up with me a week into it, and I had to stay the whole summer. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is I would have done anything. Just done anything to spend time with her. Why? Because my heart changed. Christian, when you became a child of God, your heart changed. And the things that you love are no longer the same things you loved before. You have a new love. A new king in your life. Paul writes, you obeyed. You obeyed is the passive voice. That means that God powerfully intervened in our lives to make us obey. God unlocked the chains that held us in the grip of sin. It was God who delivered us from the stronghold of sin. The release from sin immediately produced a new lifestyle of obedience towards Jesus Christ. It was transformational. It was radical. It wasn't a progression type of thing. Oh, well, I'll just give up some sin now and then I'll move on. And, and no, it was a heart change. And, and, and you decided that, hey, I belong to God now. Our hearts were changed so that now our obedience is not doing something against our will. You're not going against your will. My will is to please God. God hasn't taken my free will away from me. I always had free will. But now my will is in line with His will. May your will be done in my life, God, not my own. You obeyed from the heart. This is not true of only some. This is true of every Christian. If you're a Christian, the reality is that you obeyed from the heart. When Paul says from the heart, he means in the internal desire to keep the Word of God that brings joy in your life. God brings us joy. We read from Psalms 56 this morning, and it's that psalm when David has been, been uh, uh, captured by the Philistines, and he's, he's talking about what can mere man do to me? What can mere man do to me? I belong to God. Christian, it doesn't matter what's going on your, in your life, whether, whether your, your, your God takes your spouse from you. He takes your job from you. He takes your health from you. He takes relationships away from you. 
where, the, where, where life seems to be crumbling around you, you can still have the joy of your salvation in the midst of all these trials and tribulations, knowing that this life is fleeting. And just as Paul said in 2 Timothy, at the end of Nero's reign, he's got a couple more years left, but he's going to kill Paul first. Paul says, I've run the race. I have, I have fought the fight. I'm being poured out like a drink offering. Christian, do you feel like you're being poured out like a drink offering for God? Or do you feel like you hold back? Or do, you, do you really see God as the God, your Father, and Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that you're willing to forgo all the pleasures of this world to be obedient to Him? Or do you hold back from Him? You see, this joy is present even when we suffer for Christ. Because it is who we are. We cannot reject what is in our hearts now. We cannot reject who Christ is. You will never deny the Christ because the Holy Spirit that indwells in you will not let you deny Him. Did you ever have your heart broken into a million pieces by someone you thought you would love forever. What did your friends say when that happened? Did they tell you what a jerk he or she was or you're better off without them, move on? But there's a problem, isn't there? Your heart won't let go. It don't matter what anybody else says. When Kathy broke up with me, I still remember the conversation. I'm outside working the yard with my dad, bawling like a baby. Boo. Life is terrible. And I remember my dad telling me, saying to me, he said, son, let me tell you something. There's plenty of them out there. But if she is the one, it'll happen. That just brought me, I wasn't a Christian. My dad wasn't a Christian. That just brought me such peace in the midst of all that. My heart was still broken with that little bit of wisdom when, when my dad said, if it's meant to be, it will be. But I still cried myself to sleep. I still was heartbroken. So all those things that happened, happened. You see, your Christian, your heart will never stop loving Jesus. Nothing in this world can replace the love that you have for Christ. If Kathy and I hadn't been together, someone else would have replaced that love. But nobody could ever replace the love that I have for Christ. In my heart, nobody. Kathy doesn't complete me. Christ completes me. Christ needs to complete us as, as Christians. And so we need to understand that since we will never stop loving Him, that when we sin against Him, we're being a disobedient child. And what does a disobedient child do who loves their father and mother? I'm sorry. I'm sorry they accept the punishment, not maybe willing sometimes, but they accept it and know that the parents love them and they move on and grow physically and emotionally intellectually we as christians do the same thing god loves us and when we sin we repent and we're convicted of that sin and god is faithful to forgive us of that sin isn't there such a sense of joy in your life christian and peace when you obey christ isn't that there for you it is for me i know that when i obey christ no matter what's going on around me i have the peace that passes all understanding. Even, even when it's costly to be obedient. When you lose friends, when you lose your job, and people who've lost their lives for the cause of Christ. There should be a desire to want to obey His Word. This should not be something we must convince ourselves to do. Verse 17, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you are given over. The word teaching means sound doctrine or divine truth. You ever been in a church that says, well, we don't really concerned about doctrine and theology. Well, they're disregarding what Scripture has to say. See, we're not talking about emptying, obeying empty religious traditions or human philosophies. Paul is describing the doctrines and theology of the Bible. It addresses who God is, who Christ is, who we are in Christ, what Christ has done in our lives and what, for, what He has done for us and what He has now required for us to do for Him. 
This refers to the entire teaching of the Old and New Testament. And when Paul says that to the pattern of teaching, the word pattern means a mark caused by a strike or blow. It indicated the indention caused by a heavy instrument, such as a rod or hammer that would be brought down hard on an object. It would make a deep dent or imprint. You see, Christian, there's so much richness in this verse here. It, it, this pattern of teaching should be an imprint in your life. You should, you should have a desire to devour God's Word, not run away from it. We think it's some chore. You see, the Word of God, the teaching of God, leaves an imprint on our souls. Given over here carries the basic meaning of delivering over to. It's true, of course, that through its reading and preaching, God's Word is delivered to believers. But Paul's point here seems to be that a true believer is also delivered into God's Word, His divine teaching. The idea is that when God makes a new spiritual creation of a believer, that's you and I, He casts us into this mold of divine truth. The idea is that when God makes us a new spiritual creation, we are alive in Him. So I close with verse 18. Look at 18 with me. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Verse 18 is not an exhortation. That comes in verse 19 we'll talk about next week. This is a statement of fact. Paul here sums up his argument from verses 16 and 17, which refutes the false charge of verse six, of 15, that if we are not under law but under grace, we, are sh we can shrug off our sin. As in verse 16, Paul makes it clear that there are two and only two options. If you're here this morning, you're either enslaved to sin or you're enslaved to righteousness. And this is true for all Christians is not true for some Christians who have been had a dramatic spiritual experience to free them from sin. It is true for all who used to be in Adam but now are in Christ. We are called and to be slave to righteousness. It doesn't mean that we're free from the old sin nature. Oh, how I wish we were. Or that we'd never be tempted by sin. I don't know about you, but I would have done just fine if God took that part away from me. But what it means is that the power of sin over us has been broken so that we no longer live under sin as our master. We do not obey sin as the normal course of our daily lives. Rather, we now obey righteousness. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Quote, that we have come under the power and control and influence of righteousness. Let me say that one more time. That we have now come under the power and control and influence of righteousness. So you see, formerly we served sin. We obeyed its desires and its urges. Now we serve righteousness. We obey God in His Word. The irony is that true freedom is not freedom to sin. Rather, true freedom is slavery to God and His righteousness. And Christian, as, as, we, as we continue in this series, I, I, I pray that you're meditating on Romans, the whole six chapters that we've gone through. We'll finish up next week. But especially Romans 6. If you're struggling with sin in your life, God gives us clear direction on it. God has forgiven you for your sin. I was speaking to somebody this week, and I've had this conversation with myself, and I've had this conversation with many other Christians. Do you ever feel a time in your life when you look back on your life and you're ashamed of what you did. As a matter of fact, it, you, you keep bringing it up and you feel like, well, I haven't done enough because I still have this guilt over sin in my past life. When I say past life, I'm talking about your life before you came to Christ. Christian, never deny who you were when you were a slave to sin, that you belonged to the enemy of God. And if somebody confronts you with that sin, you say, yeah, that was me. That's who I was. But I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm a slave to righteousness. And my Christ forgave me for that sin. Am I ashamed of what I did? Absolutely. But I am free in Christ now. And I will not allow my past to dictate 
my future and my, ta my past actions to negate what God has called me to do now. You are worthy, Christian. You are worthy. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You see, you are worthy. And you are not worthy because of anything that you or I have done. We are worthy because Christ is our Savior. And rejoice in that, Christian. Rejoice in that. I, I encourage you this morning that if, if you are struggling with sin in your life, reflect on Romans 6 again. Go back and read Romans 1 all the way through to where we have finished today. And be reminded of what you have been saved from and who you belong to now. We are all called to act lives, act out our lives in, in obedience. We all fall, uh, struggle and stumble and fall, and yet we, are, we have a wonderful Savior who's forgiven us. That's why we can have joy in this life. But if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ and you're a slave to sin, your master is Satan, and you obey his commands. It doesn't have to be that way. All you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Confess it with your mouth. Believe that Jesus went to the cross to pay for your sins. They suffered, died, and was buried and rose on the third day. And the Bible says you're His. And because of that, now you live a life that is free from sin in the sense of its punishment. And now you're free to live for Him. Why do you tarry? What keeps you? What pride are you not willing to let go of in order to surrender to Christ? Christian, this morning, in just a moment, I will stand up front. And that's a time when we have the opportunity, if you've been visiting here for a while and God has said, this is the place that I want you to come and be part of that fellowship, to come and, and to serve, not only God, but to serve His people. And that's what we're called to do, and to love His people. Can't do that outside of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. So if God has called you to be at this place, I, I pray that you come and you grab this preacher by the hand and let me know that. Some of you need to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, a, an act of obedience. I pray that you follow your Lord's command. Baptism does not save us, but again, it's an act of obedience. Some of you, my brothers and sisters, you know that you have not, not been living a life that was indicative of somebody who's a slave to righteousness, but more so a slave to sin. It hasn't cost you your salvation, but it has cost you your joy. It has cost you your peace. Confess that to the Lord. Not to me, not to anybody else, but confess it to the Lord. And cry out to Him. He is always willing and able through the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in you to live a life for Him. However God is speaking to you today through, the, through this message, as I have said many times before, this was a monologue and you have had a dialogue with the Holy Spirit this very hour. May God's will be done in your life. Father, thank you so much for your mercy and grace that we don't deserve. We all deserve hell, Father, and yet you've saved us. And we give you glory for that. Help us be obedient to you. Help us to understand we are slaves of righteousness and no longer slaves to sin. Father, may your will be done in this place this day, and may your will be done in our lives. May your will be done in my life. I ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You come as the Lord leads, as Pastor Cal leads us in song.